We're very fortunate to have Grover Fugate from the Rhode Island Coastal Program here to share with us virtually um, the scenario-based uh, sea level rise permitting tool that they are using uh, at, for the Rhode Island Coastal Program. So I wanted to just thank Grover for his time today and thank everyone for listening in. Um, also just to note that we're recording the webinar for future viewing. Um, and yeah, I think we'll, we'll have Grover do his presentation and then we'll have a little bit of time for, for Q&A. So I'm just going to kick it over to you, Grover. Okay, thank you. Um, that was a little background on how we arrived here. Um, back, uh, actually almost a year before Sandy, we had just gotten out of a very contentious hearing on a road uh, fortification project. Uh, within the town of South Kingstown, and the, where there were a number of interveners in that, including the Conservation Law Foundation, Save the Bay, and others. One of the key criticisms that was coming out of the hearing from a lot of parties is that they felt that the application was not uh, considering or taking a longer range look that it needed to take uh, in terms of these potential impacts and what the best potential solution might be for this area. So one of the um, components within the decision itself on that was that the council would engage in a long-range planning process to look at the shoreline, the changes it was undergoing, and what might be the best way to handle future applications coming into it. So as a result of that, we entered into this planning process. I said it was almost a full year before Sandy. And what happened with Sandy was we experienced some damage here, but not as uh, great, obviously, as New York or New Jersey. But um, the one thing that Sandy did do for us is open the, the gates for funding, uh, which we then started to apply for a series of grants for various projects uh, and were quite successful. All in told, between the habitat restoration work that we were doing as part of that and also the planning work, we got about $11 million dollars. Uh, from the federal government uh, and other sources um, to undertake components of this project which acted as a large umbrella for many things. One of the key components of this was to start to develop tools for us to look at uh, what the scenarios might bring us in the future and how to react to that from a permitting perspective, but it also uh, what we realized is that the impacts were going to be well beyond our jurisdiction and reach inland into the community, into the floodplains, and particularly the future floodplains, uh, those that will be there with sea level rise. So uh, the tools that we were developing we thought would also be potentially useful to the municipalities as well as ourselves. So the whole system has been designed so that it can essentially be a seamless transfer to the municipality if they wanted to use it or not. So um, that's a little bit of a background on this. The project itself was looking at three threats. We were looking at sea level rise. We were looking at the storm effects. Those are typically associated for us with either tropical or extratropical, so hurricanes and nor'easters. And then the erosion impacts that occur long range uh, from these two previous ones. And what we're finding through the research and the literature and the modeling that we've done is that there looks as if there will be an acceleration within the erosion component as sea level rise starts to occur when you combine that with storms. But there are other synergistic effects uh, too that most people don't realize, such as the jumping of the recurrence level of storms and those types of things that can happen with sea level. So um, we wanted to make sure that as we were going through that, we were capturing that, but also trying to educate the public. The typical audience that we are working with in the municipalities, the planners, and they're not really trained in the same way that our coastal engineers are or coastal geologists. Are. And so the language we use on a day-to-day -day basis tends to be very foreign to them. And part of this has been a huge education process, which was still ongoing uh, with many of the municipalities. So 
we are experiencing this already. This isn't something that we're looking at in the future. This is a tidal event that's occurring down in our Watch Hill area. Um, we can see these um, probably six to eight times a year at least, if not more, uh, with team tide events or uh, spring tide events, if you want to call it. But as you can see, this is the entrance to the Yacht Club. Uh, in that day, they needed a boat to get to the Yacht Club. They have since spent $5 million in elevating this structure to get it out of the tidal influence, although the parking lot and the entrance to the Yacht Club are still impacted. Now the picture I'm going to show you here, and this is kind of astounding to me when I look at it because of the rapidity of change that we're seeing along our shoreline, but there's a building in the front with a deck on it. Uh, it's about the middle, third, well, about a third over from the right-hand side. It's a long roof building white with a deck on it. Um, that's called the Ocean Mist, and as you can see, there's a very healthy beach in front of it at this point. Um, probably about 200 feet of beach in there. The date on that is 1991. That's today. So as you can see, there's been a huge loss of our uh, shoreline in that area. It's experiencing one of the highest erosion rates. The uh, Fort Ticonderoga seawall you see in back, that's actually illegal. We're in the process of uh, an enforcement proceeding with them on this one right now but they are obviously trying to stop the erosion from completely undermining the building. The other thing that we unintentionally had to deal with when we were going through this is at the same time we started the project up, FEMA had come out with a new set of maps uh, for our area, uh, and this was after Sandy. And what they did is the new maps along our south shore, which is a uh, sediment star wave dominated coastline, is they lowered the flood elevations along our shoreline by three to four feet in some areas. And as you can imagine, a storm going in the state of New Jersey, which wasn't even really a hurricane by the time it hit, taking out 360,000 homes, you would think they might hedge their bets on that one, and they didn't. Um, when we questioned them on it, they got very defensive and said they were standing by their maps. They thought it was good science, and that was it, even though we pointed out a number of problems had with it, that it did not reflect our reality. This is just going to show you uh, that the, the problem that we were experiencing. And on the left-hand side are the old maps, and the Right-hand side are the new maps. Now, this is the uh, same segment of shoreline in, down in the south coast area. And as you can see, they went from 18 to 15. The red represents velocity zone or V-zone. The blue is A-zone. So as you can see, they actually even dropped some of the V-zones into A-zones, meaning that people didn't have to go up on pile of supported buildings. They could build on the ground surface. And the elevations changed. Uh, I mean, the elevations didn't change that much, but what they did do is change the V to the A. And again, we questioned them on this, said it didn't make any sense, and again, they got defensive on us. Um, we asked them for their federal consistency certification. Uh, they asked, what was that? Mm -hmm. um, about a year to get it back to us. Um, and lo and behold, they believed they were consistent. We denied it, and um, we're still in that process of trying to deal with it. Hey, yeah. Grover, yes. this is Michelle, sorry to interrupt you. Um, we can see your main slide and your next slide, so I'm wondering, since the main slide is pretty small, if you, if you could make that bigger and hide the next slide, is that, is that possible you could do that so we can see the main slide a little bigger? I am just trying to figure out how to do that because... Click on the presenters. Uh, there, yeah. that's good. <laughs> we can see a Perfect. lot Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, um, yeah, back to the FEMA maps. Um, we asked a um, professor that works at the University of Rhode Island here in the Ocean Engineering Department. He's a world-class modeler. He has had his own company that worked dealing a lot in modeling around the world. 
uh, is a good friend of mine. So I asked him to dig into this and find out what the base cause of this was. There were a whole host of errors uh, that he uncovered when he started to dig into it. Um, I'm going to show you some of the major ones here in a second. But um, it's very interesting for coastal managers, I think, to understand how these things are developed and what goes into them um, because there are a series of limitations associated with them. For example, when they're developing a recurrence level storm, so that 1% or one, you know, what we call the 100 year storm, there's obviously when you're trying to fit the curve, and in our region we have two extreme events. We have the 1954 and 1938 hurricanes, so not a lot of data, thank God, in the outer extremities of the database. And so that causes problems when you're trying to fit the curve. One of the things they did was change the methodology by which they fit that extreme, those extreme events, and didn't tell anybody. And that resulted in the 1938, which is generally accepted around here in most of the engineering realm as a one in 250 year storm, now becoming a one in 500, which meant the curve dropped. The other thing, though, that's important to understand is that when FEMA goes to fit the curve, you obviously have the upper 95, the lower 95, and then the mean. FEMA uses something just slightly above the mean in establishing the reoccurrence level storm, which means half the time they're going to be wrong and half the time they're going to be right. So if you're trying to be more conservative and hedge your bets, you may want to push that analysis like we did up to the upper 95% confidence interval so that you're relatively certain you won't see flooding events greater than what is being depicted. But anyhow, the other issue that there was, as I said, there were a series of issues. That, that, that one of the major ones was um, FEMA is using a methodology here from the 1970s. Essentially what they do is they establish transects along our shoreline and they run a model called WAFUS. And WAFUS takes the 100-year storm event offshore and then sort of pushes that across the landscape. And that determines where your V, A, and X zones are going to be. Um, and then they'll go to another transect on the shoreline. And literally, when you talk to the contractors, they got some kid in the back room that's trying to connect the two lines. So you end up with all these crazy situations where you have these V, X zones adjacent to each other. Um, there are physical possibilities that can't occur in the real world, but they're depicted on the maps. Part of the reason for that um, is when, at least in our location, what they did is when they went to get the wind field to drive that 100-year storm offshore, rather than going to the Army Corps hindcast stations, uh, which the Army Corps maintains here, they went up into the bay and took the wind record from one of the airports. So for those who know about hurricanes and as it encounters wind, I mean land, it, the wind field is diminishing rapidly at that point. And as a result, the wind records that they were pulling were underestimating what the 100-year event was. So they were saying to us that a 100-year event is about a four-meter wave offshore. Well, we had a storm come in about a month ago that uh, were pushing four meter waves and it was not a hundred year event by any means. With the, the figure that they should have been using is closer to nine meters uh, for the waves offshore. Of course, where you're now taking that and using half of what you should for the input into the model, you start to understand why they were underestimating um, some of these, these situations that we see along our shoreline. And as you can see, there were a number of other problems and limitations within their methodology, and I could spend the next hour talking about that, but anyhow. This will give you a good idea of what the situation looks like. So what we did is we took two, let me back up a little. The Army Corps was funded after Sandy to do what's called the North Atlantic Comprehensive Study, which was the, probably the largest modeling effort the Corps undertaken in terms of storms and storm modeling since their inception. Um, it was about a $19 million effort. They were using supercomputers to drive the scenarios and then to fit the curves better so that they, we could develop better recurrence level storms. They were using a series of synthetic storms rather than the actual database. So they had about a thousand 
synthetic storms of tropicals and 100 extra tropicals into the database. And then they had a grid system that was down to about 100 meters offshore uh, that they were using, uh, ADSERC and ST-WAVE. And they got those two models fully coupled so they were running and then developed, uh, as I said, those synthetic storms and then ran the models for those. There were discrete points along the shoreline and offshore where the model run data was saved, called save points. And then what we did with that is we got our own version of AdCirc and SD-Wave. We took the Army Corps grid, we downscaled that to our shoreline of 10 meters, in some cases 5 meters, to resolve some of the issues. We took their database and then started to run our own analysis, um, the AdCirc and SD-Wave, so that we could estimate what the uh, base flood elevations should be rather than relying on the FEMA maps. So the map you see to the left is the new mapping that we've done uh, with AdCirc and SD-Wave. And the one on the right is uh, FEMA's map. So you're going to see the resolution varies greatly, and that's because we're capturing all the topography and all the bathymetry. Uh, we're using our digital elevation model, and the spatial resolution is about a meter on the ground, five inches vertically. And then we have the FEMA maps to the right. Uh, there's a line uh, on one of those maps that goes transects right across the beach. So the beach is essentially flat in that area, but on that line they're saying that there's a five-foot difference in the flood elevation right where it uh, transects the beach there. Um, that's just, again, one of the, the sort of artifacts within their mapping that caused us problems. The other thing that I should tell you that should start to draw some uh, distinctions between the two maps is we're using the same color ramp for both maps. So they're estimating, for instance, that as you get across the pond, the surge is dropping down to 12 or 10 feet, and we're saying, no, it's more like 20 feet. So the underestimation uh, is significant. It's not a matter of inches or even a couple of feet. It's as much as 6 to 10 feet in some locations uh, on these maps. So um, what we decided to do on the basis of this was go back and we got funding to go and develop our own floodplain maps for the entire state, which we're calling design elevation maps. I think we all know that there's a climate issue with the FEMA maps. Um, and I don't have to tell any people this. It's um, something that's going to be hitting hard in the future, and Freddie Mac has already indicated that there's going to be a downturn in the real estate market once this starts to kick in. That will be worse than the 2008 um, problem that we had in the real estate market, but it will be even greater, um, not only because of the magnitude of the issue, but also because it will be a permanent loss with sea level rise. So, um, and FEMA's not accounting for this. The other thing is, it's quite evident, is nobody's telling people what the future conditions might look like so they can try to anticipate that and build that into their building scenarios, which is one of the things we were trying to capture and deal with. Part of this started out, and we started working with the Realtors Association and trying to get information to landowners. So we developed this property guide that's online uh, but what it's geared around is a series of questions. If you're purchasing property, what are some of the things you ought to think about? All this is trying to educate people in terms of coastal hazards, uh, what they are, the fact that there's risk in the system, and there will always be risk because you can't uh, necessarily design out 100% risk-free, and therefore there's always residual risk within that system. And, trying to educate people and get a measure across the system of what that risk is so they can evaluate and make their own judgments as to how much they're willing to bear. The other thing, though, that we deal with, and I'm sure you guys deal with too, is we have a lot of developers that come in and flip structures uh, in the coastal region, and therefore, once people see a coastal permit, they assume that everything's okay, and they don't understand that developers are often jumping through whatever hoops we ask them to jump through to get that permit. And with each hoop they jump through, there is another level of risk that's being added in to their projects. 
The subsequent buyers have no idea, though, what they're getting. And so part of this is also to create within the system a, um, a way that we can show and transmit that risk assessment through time so that future buyers can also understand that. One of the first things we developed is a set of maps out of this. This is an online viewer. It's called Storm Tools. You can go to it on your smartphone. Anybody can view it. Uh, and again, this is using our digital elevation model. So th this is about a meter resolution on the ground, five inches vertically. So it allows us to get into people's backyards. One of the things that I think most of sea level rise viewers and other pieces of information that are given out to people really don't get you down to the property level, and that's where all the decisions are being made. So that was the choice we made was to make sure that we could get a system that would get us right down into people's backyards so that we could give them this information as to what the uh, various components of risk are and how that affects their property and how they might think about trying to develop in a more resilient uh, way. This is just showing that this is um, showing you a 100-year base flood elevation. Then what it shows you also is the expansion of the floodplain that occurs with sea level. And you can associate the sea level with time uh, horizons, but this allows people to watch the expansion of that uh, floodplain in time. Based on the new no estimates, and I don't know what they are for your area, but we're looking at our tide gauge station here in Rhode Island at the high estimate within the 83% confidence interval, it's about 9.6 feet by 2100. So we've now developed a 10 foot layer and because we get extreme high tide events and wind-driven tide events, we also have to account for another foot and a half to two feet of tide sometimes. So we've developed a 12-foot layer also that has been added into this that people can go and look at. So this, because it's online and it's a, a geographic information database, it can be integrated with other systems. So what this is showing is that we've, in this case for the city of Warwick, brought in critical infrastructure elements so it shows their firehouses, police stations, uh, law enforcement, hospital facilities. And again, showing that 100-year storm event, but also the expansion of the floodplain that occurs as sea level rises. But you can click on each one of those little icons, and they have very detailed information. What became evidence of this, and you really can't see it because it's under the box, is that the neck, uh, Warwick neck in Warwick, actually gets cut off during a storm. They will not be able to get to it during the storm because of that, and it may take a day or two to clear the debris to be able to get out there um, once the storm passes. That became important because when we were working with the EMA guys, uh, it, it became obvious that if a fire got started out there during the storm, they had no way of getting out there unless they pre-positioned equipment. So these were some of the things that were starting to come out of the discussions and working with this tool that we were uh, working with the municipalities. As I indicated to um, our coastal geologist uh, and the scientists we were working with, we asked them to come because they're very good at looking at what happened in the past but not so much predicting in the future. What would it, our future look like as we start to see the acceleration within sea level, particularly as it uh, relates to erosion? So this was the best they could come up with. And the scenario at this time was also 6.6 .6 feet. I should just point out, not the 10 that we're currently looking at. But this was an estimate of about two times or a doubling of our erosion rate by 2100 with as much as two and a half times. So we started to provide some mapping to go back with that. And again, this is something for the municipalities to look at, to look at particularly planning for infrastructure. But the red now, is areas that are likely to erode and be underwater. And the bandwidth is changing there because it's adjusted for the underlying geology and all this. And the small yellow line you see there would be the current beach. And then we have both commercial and residential setbacks, which we wanted people to understand. So if they lost their home or had to move in the red area, they may have to set back some additional amount on top of that in order to get out of there. So as you can see, 
there's a number of homes that are underneath that uh, those bands and commercial structures that are likely to be impacted by this. Uh, but it was also trying to provide the communities with sort of a wake-up call in terms of what their future is going to look like and to start thinking about things like how do you access those people down in certain areas? Are there potential road relocations, for instance, that you should be looking at for the future and, and how do you deal with that? Another issue that we started to deal with is uh, because the modeling we were working on, we were asked by another group and we did um, develop a freshwater model for the Patuxent River. Patuxent River in Rhode Island has three sewage treatment plants on it and was a, uh, a very big problem area in the 2010 floods, which were, that was a precipitation event that we had that flooded out those sewage so treatment plants, they went back and made some adjustments for the precipitation event, but wanted to then know if we had sea level rise or a storm surge coupled with precipitation, um, where we were getting a coupling of those events, what would happen? So this is showing the expansion within the floodplain, for instance, just due to sea level rise and how that 2010 flood would expand and flood additional areas on the basis of the new sea level rise. So as we started to develop these um, tools, we were sitting in the room with our researchers and we were looking at, and we had now wave data, we had surge data, we had erosion data, we had sea level rise data, and we said it would be nice if we could sort of look at the shoreline and weight it for those factors and come out with an indices that sort of helps measure the risk within those areas. So we decided to work uh, with the ocean engineering class on a small scale experiment down in the Matunic area to see if we could do it. So this is the essential building blocks of Siri, but what is interesting in this is, uh, for those of you who are familiar with HAZIS, um, FEMA has this tool called ASIS, but within it is embedded this thing called damage functions. And damage functions are where they send out uh, teams, damage assessment teams, and they just updated this after Sandy. And they go into areas that they look at the building types, and then they look at how much they were damaged by the structure, and then they estimate what the potential surge or waves were in that area, and then start to plot out by percent damage uh, by building type what each of those were for each building that was damaged. We got the raw data and we had our, our people go back and refit the curves to the data um, to see what it looked like. And then we started to take those damage functions and from those you can write an algorithm and embed it into AdCERC and SD Wave. And what you can start to do is this type of thing. This now, is showing what the percent damage would be structure by structure within the area. And this is a 100-year storm event. So for us, that would be like a 1954 hurricane. So it gives us a percent damage to each building. And then it also shows us those that are likely to be lost in the future to sea level and those that will be likely lost to erosion. So it's combined indices of both storm and then those long-range factors of sea level rise and erosion going into the system. Uh, this is down in the Charleston area. So this is zero sea level rise, 100-year event. That's two feet of sea level rise. The reason we chose two is that was our estimate that would likely occur within the 30-year mortgage period. So it gives us a uh, sort of a look at, uh, within that planning framework at least, what the additional damage would be but it's also an astronomical high tide for us today. So we can see here, if I go back and forth, what the damage will likely be uh, from either a high tide event or uh, going into the future, the additional sea level rise. Again, when we started to develop all these tools, 6.6 .6 feet was our highest estimate. So now that's seven feet of sea level rise. So if I go back to even the two, you can see the difference. Wow. The big difference is there's a lot more blue, meaning those homes are now lost to sea level rise, and a lot more erosion 
so those black dots are now homes that are lost to erosion. And then you're seeing a lot more red starting to appear in the upper reaches the watershed, which means the storms are acting at a higher level in those structures. So where they may have survived before, they won't survive into the future. And this is just showing how it can get down to the individual structural level. That smaller slide in the lower right is the individual structures. And then the colors that are associated with them are the estimates of damage uh, to each of those structures. We were working with some students at the University of Rhode Island who are, who are good at visualizations. There was an architect who was working with us. So he started to take and essentially develop 3D models of each of the structures. And then we would import the data into his system and then start to give people what a visual might look like. So this blue is representing the flood envelope from a 100-year event. The colors represent the percent damage to each of the structures from that event. And you can start to get a, uh, a very good picture. People can actually recognize their homes and pick them out. This is two feet of sea level rise and what it will do to the area. And as you can see, the red really starts to pick up. But the flood event also starts to penetrate further. And then if we go to seven, there's nothing left on the beach. And it's virtually all red. We also, because in our region, um, it's not the waves and surge, it's also the winds that are extremely damaging. We wanted to see if we could do this with wind. So we went and we gathered a lot more data working with the town. We started to extract that data and then put that into the model so that we could do a further add-on to the analysis. This is just wind now. This is down in the Musquamacan area. And this, again, is pre pre predicting the percent damage that will be done to each structure by just wind. Um, most of our structures in this state were built before 2005. The reason that's important is 2005 is when the requirement came in for hurricane clips on roofs. So if the roof starts to go, obviously the structures aren't designed for water intrusion. Um, and so it becomes a very big problem for both livability and insurance on the other side. And this is was a way for us to sort of get at an estimate or estimate what the damage would be within these areas. So going back to those visualizations again, here's one for the Musquamacan area showing the present coastline. The color code is percent damage. This is a 100-year event. But now you're seeing up into the watershed itself um, colors that are now showing wind damage as well as the coastal storm damage associated with surge and waves. The other issue is, is that we have been working with IBHS, which is the International Business and Home Safety Institute, and they focus primarily on the wind. But they were doing a series of tests on shingles. And they were finding routine failure of shingles, even though they're supposed to be designed in our area for 130 a mile an hour winds, and we're having routine failure at 70 miles an hour. So building up to a Cat 1 hurricane, uh, they were getting routine failure of, of roof deck. And again, once that happens, you get water intrusion in the structure, you get to lost the contents, and within 48 hours, mold starts to set in, and you really start to have problems at that point. Virtually every home in Rhode Island has that potential exposure. There's a very easy fix to it, which we're now starting to integrate into our building code. But it means going back and just uh, putting those fixes back in so that we could build better roof decks. That alone, just that simple little measure would reduce our exposure from these storms by almost 50%. So there's some real nice low-hanging fruit that, that started to come out of this. This, again, is the seven feet. This is showing the new pond now. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot more red. And the little black squares you're seeing there are lost structures that are lost to sea level rise or erosion uh, going into the future. Now, as we started to work with the towns, the towns got very nervous about seeing individuals' houses color-coded um, and what they might get back in terms of blowback from um, their residents and, and constituents. So we decided to sort of step back and take it to see if there was another way of presenting this information. So what we've developed now 
are these maps that show structural damage risk. And essentially what we do is we take the most susceptible structure within that area and we superimpose it over the landscape, run the storm, and then get the building damage estimates and then sort of collate those into these heat maps that you see where you're getting everything from extreme risk down to, to no risk or moderate at best within the storm envelope, I mean the flood envelope itself. So this is a 100-year uh, event that would, and the building structure risk that's associated with a 100-year event. If we were to go back and put the structures back in, the individual structures, the color ramps line up very closely with those individual structures, but this was a way of sort of generalizing the information so the municipalities didn't get too worried uh, about the results coming out of it. If we go to the seven feet of sea level rise, what you're seeing here now is obviously much more flooding, but those darker areas are now inundated, so they're permanently lost uh, out of the system and now showing up as uh, areas that will be uh, underwater. Um, what we have done within our coastal program here is we've embedded the NOAA sea level rise curves within our program. This is what we use, so we're using the high curve and as you can see, it's showing the probabilities associated with the various confidence intervals. We're using the 83% confidence interval right now within our system. So the new permitting process that was fully adopted by the council now and put in place runs something like this. So we ask an applicant to choose their design life. How long do you want that structure to last? And with that, it essentially sets the scenario. So whatever design life they choose, we then give them the scenario that they have to look at. Uh, it's sea level rise, storms, and erosion. Then what they will do is, is take that information and go back and start to look at that. Um, and we ask them not only to look at just their site, but also the access points in and out of there to make sure that they can reach their homes um, with these events or with this particularly sea level rise, whether it will continue to be accessible uh, as the roads go into the future. So this is a, a way of sort of helping educate the, the potential developers and applicants coming before us as to what their risk might be. We also have developed SLAM maps. So this is sea level rise affecting marsh migration. It's again down to the individual property level. And this estimates the migration of, or lot, not their lack thereof, um, of marshes in those areas and where marshes are gonna be lost or where they might migrate into the upland areas. What we're asking major projects, those are subdivisions or large scale projects where we have more room on the lot to take and look at the SLAM maps and see how they can adjust the lot lines or the building envelopes to allow for that marsh migration to occur in the future. Ultimately, they take all that information and they go through a design elevation. Uh, we give them the new floodplain maps. Floodplain maps also have sea level rise scenarios built into them so that they can see what the floods in the future might look like. And then we ask them to go back and see what they can do to design it they submit an application, our staff verifies the scenarios that they've associated with the design lives, and then ultimately the design life and the scenario information gets embedded into the staff reports, which then gets captured into the permit. The permit gets registered on title so that when future landowners are buying these houses, they can see what the level of risk was that was assumed by the original builder and whether they want to do that. So it's sort of trying to embed the system, a measure of market or a market signal that could be picked up by people and then evaluated into the future as buyers gets more sophisticated in, in this analysis. Um, so all this is in place now. We actually developed this with the realtors and the builders. The builders have bought into this because we're also have come to the realization here, and, and it's not unusual, it's most of these codes, that a lot of our building stock was built prior to any of the good codes, and therefore we have a lot of built-in exposure. The only way we're going to get out of that is to go back and essentially um, deal with a lot of retrofitting, which was another reason we wanted to focus in on the fortified system, because it was originally developed 
as a retrofit system uh, to help people figure out how to make their homes more resilient. So that's what the process looks like. Um, those are the five steps, uh, and we're starting to just implement it now. The council adopted last week the, the entire program. Uh, they had adopted the new permitting section about a month ago, but now the entire plan's in place, uh, and we're looking to go forward from here. Anybody left? <laughs> <laughs> We're all, our mouths are dropped. <laughs> so I have a question just since you ended on the recent adoption. Um, how much, uh, if any, pushback did you get from uh, property owners uh, and or members of the public um, on uh, all the way through, you know, municipalities? You made it sound like you were working in concert with the municipalities along the way in the tool development. I'm just wondering how that played out um, with adoption of this permitting process. Yeah, one of the advantages of using, because we, we closely work with the University of Rhode Island, so one of the advantages of working with the scientists there is that very rarely do people challenge us on the science. Um, and so I think there's, at least here in Rhode Island, there's a, a gradual acceptance of the fact that climate change is occurring and yes, conditions are going to be worse. The question is how much worse. We got a little bit of pushback in the beginning on using um, the 100-year event or the 95% confidence interval for estimating that, I should say. Um, there was some that wanted to us to go back to the mean, which we were not going to do. But once we made it clear this was not going to impact their insurance rates, the insurance companies really don't care about flooding. They care about wind. Uh, and FEMA wasn't listening to us anyhow, so they had no worry there. Um, so once they got over that, it wasn't too bad. Now, we've been working with the municipalities also. Chapter 6 of this plan goes in how, we, how they could start to adopt some of this stuff and use it. And we sat down with a municipal working group that we had when and asked them the question, OK, what will make your job easier to try to take and use some of this information? So they gave us a series of suggestions, which we put within the chapter. A lot of them are legislative changes that will have to occur. Um, but obviously, there are things that they could start to, to uh, put into place and, and practice now if they want to, and that's why we made the, the tools completely transferable across our jurisdiction into theirs. Interestingly enough, a lot of the municipalities during the process, particularly towards the end when they started to see the technical side of this and how complex it was getting, they have been asking us to essentially take over this particular aspect from the application process and just take it over and take it away from them. Um, because they'd rather not deal with it. Um, that is potentially under discussion, not for next session, but for a couple of years out that uh, they may push the council in that direction so it would expand our jurisdiction to encompass the entire floodplain and start to make those types of decisions. So it's, it's been sort of a healthy relationship. The one thing that I'll say that's been sort of a bit of a tension between the South County towns and ourselves is because FEMA underestimated the floodplain so badly, and we are pushing a substantial amount of freeboard that we're asking for within the building envelopes. Uh, the, 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 a lot of the planners are concerned about the aesthetics of the community. Mm -hmm. We're not so much concerned about the aesthetics as we are the survivability. And so we get down into those very basic discussions with the planners that this is really an issue whether these buildings will survive into the future or not. We took and took some of that database, and what we did is we have the E911 database, which gives us a centroid for every structure in the state of Rhode Island. We took the storm uh, and sea level rise scenarios and then went back and melded that with the E911 database. So we have an estimate for every structure in the state for the sea level rise flood envelope of whether they will be impacted or not. Then we took and cross-referenced that 
with the tax assessor database to give us an idea of what the potential losses are going to be into the future in tax base. In some of these communities, that the potential losses are staggering. Um, we're talking about with a 100-year event and six feet of sea level rise, they'll lose 60% of their tax. Um, so there, there are issues that are out there that I think they're just starting to come to grips with. And really, it's it's we also have been sort of looking on the solution side, and there's not a lot of solutions out there, um, which is, I think, the, one of the biggest frustrations in dealing with the municipalities is trying to show them that there's a cliff there. Now they want to know how to get to the other side. And uh, there's not a lot of information out there to help them get to the other side on this one. Okay. I had a question. Uh, I'm wondering if you could talk about um, how much discretion applicants have when they're choosing the design life um, in this first step that you've outlined. No, that's a very good question. Um, we had an internal debate here because my staff wanted to basically mandate a design life. Um, obviously, the 30-year mortgage period becomes a, a logical point, and we do encourage that within the plan. But the problem we have, um, and I'll just give you another analogous process that we dealt with, and, and which is sort of giving us the same issue here. When we first started to deal with stormwater, um, there weren't a lot of independent third-party uh, validations of what technologies were going to work for stormwater. And so we saw a lot of commercial projects coming through uh, pushing their particular product on us with the data supposedly that would show how this thing would meet our 80% TSS. Um, ultimately, there was a stormwater center at least located here in New England at the University of New Hampshire that was able to, to go back and test some of these systems. And lo and behold, the vast majority of those systems did not work. They did not meet the 80% TNSS. A lot of the data was cooked by the developers, by the technology people themselves. That same issue is, is prevalent within the building industry. Unless there's a third party element out there that can rate these design improvements in terms of the actual design life that it will add, um, it's very hard for us to say that, yes, that 30-year design life that you've chosen can be met by the particular design alterations that you're going to make to your structure. As a result of that, we are not forcing them to necessarily go to a very high design life. But again, what we're trying to do is, is record all that through the permitting process and have that carry through the title search process so that as people are buying homes or looking at these issues, that will become a discussion point at some point within the transaction as to what the design life is and what measures they, they're taking. We also encourage the people that are on the buying side to have their engineers do a, their own independent evaluation of the design measures that were used and whether they actually meet uh, the design life that people are representing within those systems. Thanks. So just out of curiosity then, are most buildings coming th recently coming through going with a 30-year design life? Are they ever going higher? I mean, in California, where most of our planning documents have 75 to 100 year design life um, requirements, which is the window that we're looking at for hazard safety. Yeah. I mean, 30, 30 years seems really low to me. <laughs> the reason that's, that's that way is that because we're also combining hurricane events with the sea level rise analysis, there's very few sites in Rhode Island that can make 100 years. They just won't do it, particularly with the sea level rise scenarios that we're looking at right now. Um, so to choose a 75 to 100 year time frame, the vast majority of sites couldn't demonstrate that at all, um, which is part of the reason for this in its first place is to educate people 
in terms of the long-term environment where they're buying property. Um, if people buy in the face of this and we're putting them on notice, they can't come back. For instance, um, like you guys, we have a prohibition on seawalls in certain areas. They can't come back and ask for a seawall at a later point because we've already told them that you're building in the face of this risk. You've accepted it on the basis of that risk and don't come back and ask for forgiveness later on, on measures that you believe are going to be necessary to, to keep your home there. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a very difficult issue that the, the design life, my guess is the way it's going to go is most people are going to say, oh, of course, I like 50 to 100 years. And when they do the analysis, they're going to realize I can't do that. I'm probably going to have to drop back to maybe 15 or 20 years. That itself, to have to make that admission to themselves, I think, is a huge education. Uh, which is what one of the things we were trying to achieve in this system is to educate people in terms of what the risk is and the, you know the, the, hopefully the market will start to to bring that into play so real the real estate industry people that you were consulting with were supportive of this not supportive but they didn't block it I was just going to add that, like you, I'm sure, we have a lot of people that this is not their primary residence on the shore. It's their second, third, or fourth home. And they have enough money that they don't care, so they say at least. Um, and so they're willing to assume a lot more risk than the average homeowner would. Um, and so we will, you know, we went in this with no expectation that there wouldn't be development on the shoreline once this occurred, but we wanted people to realize, that, again, that risk and to, to be able to transmit that risk through the, throughout the, the uh, property transfer process. It can provide a, a measure for people then to start evaluating those decisions. Just out of curiosity, how far does the coastal zone, or like what does your coastal zone encompass? <laughs> Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> okay, are you ready? <laughs> yeah. There are five categories of projects anywhere they occur in the state have to come into us, and they include things like energy processing, transferring, solid waste disposal sites, those types of things. They go through what's called the 320 evaluation. We determine whether there's a probability of coastal impact. And then if there is, then they have to go through the full-blown permit process. If we don't, then we release them with a waiver at that point. So those are five categories anywhere in the state. We also have what's called uh, watershed jurisdiction for certain areas. So we capture large-scale developments within the watersheds of certain areas. And then they go through the full-blown permitting process. We have all of tidal waters. And the General Assembly gave us a thing called coastal features. So these are generally coastal physiographic features. They're defined within the programs. But it's just, if we were to take a barrier system, for instance, um, we capture the, um, the beach side, the, the water side, the ocean side. That goes across the barrier. So we capture the entire barrier. We capture the wetlands on the other side. And then we capture the tidal, uh, tidally influenced pond, the lagoon system on the other side. Then it goes over and transitions to wetlands. We capture those wetlands. We also capture the freshwater wetlands that are contiguous or in the vicinity of the coast. And then wherever those wetland boundaries are, 200 feet from those wetland boundaries is also within jurisdiction. So it's what's called a tiered jurisdiction, but it's, it's a very complex um, jurisdictional component. And then our federal consistency boundary is totally different than that. So. So do you have policies that prohibit development in those coastal feature areas? Yes, on uh, undeveloped or moderately developed barriers, because we classified all the barrier systems in our state into three categories. So the moderately developed or undeveloped barriers, and that's 82% of our barriers, we prohibit commercial and residential development on. Any more questions in here?
So do you have ever, have you ever had issues of takings brought up if you denied a, a permit based on this modeling tool? Yeah, we went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court on a takings case. <laughs> the Palo Zolo case went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. There was a developer wanted to come in and fill 20 acres of wetland on a coastal pond, and we said no. Um, yes, there are takings cases, but they haven't, we haven't had any recent ones in a while. Most people seem to, because the regulations have been in place since 1983, have a fairly decent understanding of that, um, although they pop up every once in a while. So it's, a, it's an ever-present threat that's out there that we deal with. What are your um, policies regarding rebuilding when a home is damaged? Um, our building official used the FEMA uh, definition here, which people tend to play with. We go off of physical damage. So if it's 50% or more damaged, they have to adhere to the new regulations, setbacks, and the rest of it, if the lock can accommodate it. If not, they may seek variances to certain setbacks, but ultimately um, there are going to be points in time where, particularly on the, uh, the barrier systems where there is some development or in some of the beach areas, uh, the headland areas, um, we're going to be saying no a lot more into the future. Uh, and that, that's, you know, I think that's just part of the existence where we're all headed at this point. And what are the typical limits on um, armoring permits? We have, if you're not familiar with the Rhode Island program, we've categorized our waters, that is the state waters, into six use categories. And part of that categorization was to sort of deal with uh, the water sheet and how to plan for it. But it also impacts the adjacent upland areas too. Type 1 and Type 2 waters, for instance, encompass about 70% of our waters. A lot of the Type 1 waters were designated for that because they were not suitable to structures, either things like docks or piers, those types of things, or because they weren't suitable to um, structural shoreline protection. Where sediments are shoreline, uh, wave dominated, uh, very erosive, and our sediment source, essentially, for the beaches is those coastal bluffs. So if we start allowing people to seal those bluffs off, it will essentially spell the demise for our beach systems here very rapidly. So on type 1 shorelines, we prohibit structural shoreline protection. If we were to look at the south coast of Rhode Island, that's most of the south coast of Rhode Island. As you get up in the bay, uh, and we have residential areas, or uh, Port industrial related areas, for instance, they are allowed to use pole canning, obviously. Some areas in the upper bay, which are type two waters, are allowed to use structural shoreline protection, but they have to first prove to us that non-structural is not feasible. Um, we are also have been working here developing a lot of uh, green infrastructure technology and modifying the regulations to provide for a very easy route if you want to go with new green technologies versus um, the, the, the old structural method. The thing we find here in Rhode Island, and I don't think most people, again, appreciate because they don't understand the issues, is that with our coast, given the exposure that we have, we have a fetch that's essentially down to Antarctic. Um, and so the, the stones that they need in a seawall have to be 30 tons each. That's one piece of granite on an 18-wheeler uh, bed. And typically, they're coming out of the state of Maine. Um, so that's each stone that has to go in the seawall. And then, of course, to protect the structure, because many of our elevated bluffs here that they're trying to armor are at about 14 feet, and the surge is coming in at 19. So they're not even protecting the structure themselves unless they elevate the wall that high and get it above uh, the wave run up. So by the time you get through with that and it has to be a trapezoid and you start to run through the numbers for these people, they quickly realize they don't even have enough property to build the wall, let alone have the cost to, to, 
to deal with it to properly protect the structure. Um, so it's it's a very again it's one of those difficult areas that we deal with day in and day out. But particularly in post storm situations, everybody wants a seawall to protect their home afterwards, and we we don't allow. And then we wow. get into enforcement with the ones that try to build without our permission. So are they only allowed to build on their own property? They would never be allowed to build on like a public beach? That's correct. So wherever the toe of the uh, structure is, it has to be on their property and they have to reprofile their property back. They can't build out into the, uh, the beach area. And then for the mapping of those six categories of water, um, are those kind of regularly updated or how are those established? They were originally established in 1983. Um, a lot of it was based on the characterization of the neighborhood and what was envisioned for that neighborhood at the, at the time. So as I, I think I indicated, 70% of our waters are type one and type two, which are low intensity waters in the state. Um, we tend to find those in residential areas or conservation areas. Uh, type three waters are uh, high intensity boating, so this is where we allow marinas to occur. So marinas can only build in type three or above waters. They can't build in type one or type two. So it's a good way of also for, uh, for us to get on that cumulative impact side. But what, the marinas like it because, uh, believe it or not, because we will go to the mat to protect their development in those areas. Uh, so if a municipality is trying to sort of push them out, we will we will intercede and, and protect the marina. Um, so it gives predictability to the system. Marinas know if they know what the targets are, they know what they have to hit in order to get expansion permits. And so it, it, it provides a predictable system and a protective system for them. Type four are multi-purpose. Those that typically are other water types go about 500 feet offshore and then it converts to a type four water. Purpose waters allow a number of uses as long as they don't degrade the habitat or water quality. Type five are tourism oriented, so there's a lot more flexibility, particularly within tourism areas, the activities that we allow. And then type six are port or industrial related waters. So obviously all the ports or the navigation channels are type six waters and again, our water type overrides local zoning. So if we have a type six waters adjacent to the area, we will not allow upland development that may jeopardize a port related activity. So if they want to put a condo development in type six, adjacent to type six waters, we wouldn't allow it within our jurisdiction. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, I realize we're um, we're getting uh, a little over time here, so um, I just want to thank you again, Grover, for doing this webinar for the California team. And um, I imagine we'll, uh, you know, if we have any follow-up questions that come our way, we'll we'll try to loop you in. But really appreciate your time and um, sharing this tool with us. Um, and it looks like we can access some of this information. I'm hoping like the application guidance on your website. Yes. The, the, um, other, the other website that's helpful is that we had set up a website dedicated to the planning effort and it's called affectionately Beach Stamp. S-A-M-P stands for the Special Area Management Plan. Okay. And uh, if you go to the website, a lot of this information, the chapters can be found there and, you know, presentations from previous uh, presenters on various topics can all be found there too. Okay. Cool. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, and thanks sure. everyone for calling in. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Bye.